Hello and welcome to the latest in our Paycheck Protection Program webinars. Today, we are going to focus on what's new, what's different, and what's still the same in the new edition of the PPP, but we're also going to explore the very valuable employee retention credit. And today, everything is going to be focused just on not-for-profit entities. I'm glad you've been able to join us today. My name is John Sweisberger. I am the partner in charge of the business outsourcing services practice for Armenino. And today I'm joined by a leader in our not-for-profit tax group, Mr. Matt Petrosky. Matt, welcome. Thank you, everyone. So today we're going to cover a handful of things. We're going to start by doing a look back at some of the lessons we've learned over the last nine months or so in dealing with what we're calling PPP 1.0. And then we're going to get into the new stuff that's the function of the Economic Aid Act that was passed just after Christmas this year or this past year and is now in effect through March 31st. And that gets into new first draw and what's called second draw loans. So we'll talk all about the nuances of those for you. And then we'll finish up with a dive into the employer retention credit. So let's get started, shall we? Let's talk about what we've taken away from our experiences over these last nine months or so in dealing with the first go around of the Paycheck Protection Program. And to start with, and I'm sure many of you who have had some rough experiences now understand the concept that lenders matter. The ones that you use, uh, we have heard some just incredible horror stories of banks that were slow to open up, unsure how to apply the rules, very hard to be able to work with. Still, even here we are in January of 2021, in some cases, haven't even opened their forgiveness portals months now after people have used up all of the PPP money. It's really important that you choose your lender carefully so that you can avoid the frustration that has uh, been absolutely ringing in our ears from so many borrowers that have been frustrated with this program. You are not required, if you're going to go get a second draw loan, to use the same bank that you used the first time around. So know that if you uh, are going to use a different lender, you're certainly going to have to send in all new information, but you're not required to use the same one. Banks are all over the map in terms of the technologies that they use, their understanding of the rules. We've had to go back and forth with a bunch of banks explaining what the rules actually are, not what they thought they had heard or read. And in some cases, getting the SBA to come in and say, yeah, these Armenino guys are right. So um, understand that they're, this isn't their business. They're not used to do, dealing with the PPP program any more than you are. They're certainly not in the business of forgiving loans. So know that they're going to be uh, kind of all over the map in terms of how effective they are at doing that. So if you're going to be looking for a new lender, make sure that not only are they good in client service, of course, I mean, that is a given, but also that they've got a good depth of knowledge and experience in working with the SBA. That's just a critical component of making this a seamless experience for you. The second thing is this whole notion of economic necessity that came out after they launched the CARES Act and the PPP program last spring. You may recall that by about the end of April, there was all this hullabaloo about large companies that had gotten PPP loans. Oh, my goodness. Ruth's Chris and Shake Shack and the Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, you know, mostly it was headlines that people were trying to grab uh, in the media. There wasn't a whole lot of real angst about it in the lender or government community by and large it was a chance to say gee in five days they didn't execute this program perfectly well of course not you know normally this would be five or six months not five or six days to get this thing rolled out uh, so in response they came out with this notion that any loan amount under two million dollars was going to be deemed as necessary you didn't have to prove anything, but any amount over $2 million, they were going to review, and they were going to ask that you prove economic necessity, because if you remember, the actual test was uncertainty about the future of the economy. Well, in April of 2020, pretty sure everybody was uncertain about the future of the economy. So it was a really low bar, but they, they finally came out then in the fall with Form 3509 
for for for-profit borrowers and Form 3510 for -for not-for-profit borrowers that basically asks a whole bunch of questions around your liquidity position and uh, your, uh, you know, use of money in different ways that maybe weren't necessarily what they wanted to see, even though they didn't expressly prohibit them on the front end. So here's the process on that. If you have a loan larger than $2 million, you will not be asked to file the form 3510 as a not-for-profit until after you have filed for forgiveness and your lender has sent that off to the SBA. The SBA triggers that process by asking your lender to send you the 3510, let's get going. Once they do that, you've only got 10 days to respond. Okay. So one of the things that we've learned from this is there are some certain best practices that we want to make sure if you're in this category with over $2 million, you apply these best practices. And to talk about that, I'm going to bring Matt in now. So Matt, what are some of the best practices that you've seen in your experience around the Form 3510? I think the most important thing is prepare. So this is not a a quick, easy form to complete quickly. I think you want to get buy-in from everyone within the organization. So it's prepare the form 3510 and and especially your narrative. Uh, You have to explain, explain anything that could potentially uh, from an optics perspective, um, look, um, look large, look like uh, someone may question it and not understand what the number uh, I would say, make, make sure you're explaining your balance sheet. I think with the nonprofits, uh, very often you, you may have an endowment. Being able to explain it, explain um, with why a number may look large, but at the end of the day, um, why for, you still met that necessity. So go through and construct those detailed narratives, including the exhibit. So it's it's not just answering the uh, the question specifically. And I know we've we, we've spoken with bar, borrowers since April about preparing a memo, preparing that, that need certification memo, really detailing what were you thinking in April or May when you were originally applied and, and bringing a lot of that in to the extent that you, you have that uh, internal document and make sure you bring in a lot of the, uh, the exhibits and the ex- explanations to tell your story as to why as an organization you met that certification of need. Yeah, this is really a time to go on offense and not play defense. You, you don't want to be in a situation where you send in your forgiveness, they, and then you get asked for the Form 3510, and you're just trying to scramble to put it together, and you submit it to your lender to go off to the SBA, hoping that they interpret something one way or don't interpret it negatively. Don't You don't want to be in a position of hope. That's not a strategy. You want to absolutely play offense and say, here's all the things that were happening, whether that's you know emails that uh, talked about our situation or obviously financial statements and tax returns and things like that, but all the things that can support why you needed this. This is a time to play offense and not leave it open to interpretation. And I think the goal is to submit that narrative together. So have everything together. Really, the, the, I think everyone's goal should be submit the 3510 and never hear from the SBA again on the need certification. So to the extent that you can explain everything included in the response so that the SBA upon review can look at this and, and, and try to check the box and say, yes, uh, no further questions required. Yeah. And here's why I mean, you don't need to send this in at the same time as your forgiveness application, but we want you to prepare it ahead of time at the same time that you're preparing your forgiveness application. And here's why you want to make sure those uh, juxtapose properly with each other. So for example, now we have the ability to define our own covered period within certain parameters, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. But for example, if there are some, uh, events that occurred late in your covered period, maybe say around week 18 or week 20, but you really didn't need 18 or 20 weeks worth of cost to be able to get your forgiveness, then you may want to be able to cut off your covered period earlier than some of those events that were maybe necessary for your business, but could be cast in the somewhat negative light, depending on how the SBA is choosing to read your uh, form 3510. So by being able to say, I want to get that out of my forgiveness 
it's just going to make it much easier to be able at that point to assert your economic necessity. So nonprofit organizations are, we're, in, in general, everyone is accustomed to uh, the Form 990. What you're filing is generally public information about the organization uh, will ultimately end up on GuideStar. But I think in this instance, there is an opportunity to check the box on the 3510 confidential. I think to the extent that uh, we, we, we recommend doing that um, it, it, as, as much as possible. Otherwise, everything will be subject to a FOIA uh, request and the information will be out there. So uh, definitely assert the, the exemption for uh, uh, FOIA in the comment boxes that, that should be able to keep the, um, the, the, your, your responses from being available and, and, and hopefully getting out, not getting out in the public. Yeah, I mean, certainly we know, Matt, that uh, the media have loved to put salacious stories about these terrible things that have happened and who got a loan and how could they have needed that. And, and now that there's all this extra information in these forms that are subject to Freedom of Information Act, you want to make sure you, you're, you're inside laundry. It may not be dirty, but it's still inside. You want to make sure that stuff's not getting exposed to the public. So, Matt, let's jump into these, the, the, the new Economic Aid Act. You've got this concept now of first draw and second draw. And let's explore kind of what's, what's really happening with that. And let's start with, with what some of the highlights of the Economic Aid Act are. Great. So the uh, the PPP loan opportunities is uh, open now through March 30, 31st. Everyone, if they remember, the uh, they originally cut the date off at August 7th. So now that is both for first draw loans and second draw loans. So there may be a, an opportunity for some organizations. We'll talk about um, uh, a few new new organizations uh, that are, are allowed, but it, there is an opportunity for some organizations that maybe return their loans um, or were eligible to get first draw loans. So now those opportunities have opened up through March 31st. The forgiveness simplification uh, is out there now for loans of 150,000 or less, expanding upon the, the previous 50,000. There are additional expense categories that are eligible for forgiveness. And now uh, John hinted at this in discussions about the 3510, but whereas before you had to choose either eight or 24 weeks as your covered period, you can actually choose a point in between. So if, you're, if you spent all of your money in week 10 or 11, you could choose that as the, uh, the covered period. And this, is, this can be significant if let's say in week 14, you had a significant reduction in FTEs. Now that, that falls outside of your covered period. Uh, and we do know that larger banks are beginning accepting loan applications on January 19th. Uh, so that, that is opening and, and uh, best to, to check with your bank, your lender, as to when they will be opening up and accepting applications. Yeah, the majority opened on the 19th, but certainly uh, not all, as we talked about on the, on the top end, not all lenders are created equal. So Matt, let's jump into kind of some of the, the nuances and start with loans that were, we'll, we'll call them 2020 loans, the ones that were issued under the original Paycheck Protection Program between April 3rd and early August of 2020. Loans that uh, our, our listeners may have but have not yet filed for forgiveness. Let's talk about some of the new forgiveness rules for them. So I mentioned the new expense categories, and this includes uh, supplier cost, operations cost, worker protection cost, and property damage cost. So hopefully, to, if, the, if there's an um, organization that is really still needing some of those expenses, or maybe what it does is these expenses allow you to use a shorter covered period, they're now allowable. Um, and, and it applies not just to the second draw, but also first draw. It expands payroll costs to include disability and group life. Uh, that's new. That was a question we, we would get all the time when uh, under the CARES Act. And now, uh, fortunately, those, those have been added. And there has been a definition of seasonal employer. I know there, we would get some questions on, on that, but that, 
that really is is now defined by the SBA. So um, it, it basically is based on uh, when are you receiving the revenue and how much. Yeah, and and this seventy five twenty five revenue ratio here, the the way it's written is one half of the year needs to be no more than one third of the other half of the year. Well, if you put that in in actual percentage terms, that means at least seventy five percent of your revenue or gross receipts comes in one half of the year and no more than 25% in the other half, but they wrote it in a really confusing way. So those are the new things, but there's some things that have changed as well, right, Matt? Right. Uh, mentioned the, the 150,000 for the, the simple loans. The, um, the, the, and this, this is one that I think a lot of people are, uh, are, are pleased about. So to the extent that you received uh, the EIDL grant, so that's a 10,000 advance, not not an idle loan itself, but uh, the uh, that no, that ten thousand dollar grant is no longer deducted from the amount of forgiveness, uh, and there there uh, there is a change to the seasonal employer look back to the so to the extent that that applies to your organization, and now we have the borrower defined covered period. So this is the ability to choose a point somewhere between eight and twenty four weeks. And on those idle grants, it's uh, yeah, it's no longer a grant in name only. It's an actual grant. If in fact you had already applied for forgiveness and gotten uh, the forgiveness granted by the SBA, and they deducted the amount of your idle advance, know that you should be getting a check directly from the SBA for that. So that's uh, exciting change and puts it back to being a real grant. So does that mean based on these two col uh, columns, Matt, that basically everything else is the same? It is. So you're still required to meet the 60% payroll um, amount to get forgiveness. So when you submit your loan, if it's if your loan amount is 100,000, at least 60,000 of that will need to be uh, payroll cost. It can be 100%. Uh, so that's just the floor. Compensation per employee is capped at an annualized 100,000. Uh, the FTEs and salary reductions uh, and look back periods. So none of the dates have changed. So when we're thinking of the, the, uh, the FTEs and the safe harbors, those, those rules are still the same. And you still have 10 months from the end of your covered period to apply for forgiveness. Right. So that's uh, that first point though is a really critical one. So where we started this, this slide was, hey, there's all these new expense categories, which are exciting, supplier costs and operations costs and things like that, that uh, you now get to include. But that 60% payroll uh, threshold is still in effect. So it may not be all that helpful to some of you, but it's, it's going to be a situation by situation thing. So, okay, Matt, that's a great coverage of those existing first draw loans from 2020. But now we've reopened the notion of first draw loans issued now during the first quarter of 2021. And so we're calling these new first draw loans to uh, distinguish them from the existing mm -hmm. first draw loans that were issued last year. So same thing. Let's talk about what's new in these. So there are some new entities that are, that are eligible, nonprofit housing co-ops, 51 C6 uh, organizations and destination marketing organizations are now eligible. Uh, and the, the destination marketing has a 300 uh, employee eligibility limit. The, so th those I think are organizations, I, I know I feel like I, I received a lot of questions originally about 51 C6s. So uh, now they are eligible. Authorized uses has been expanded. So these are the, um, the, the expenses we, we discussed and also uh, three new certifications are required. Exactly. So, and for those of you that don't know what an SVG is, that's for a shuttered venue grant, which is a whole nother part of the Economic Gate Act. Um, so those are entirely separate from the PPP program, but you can't do both. Uh, if you qualify for a, a shuttered venue grant. Okay, Matt, what's, what's changed in, the, in these new loans? Well, the loan application form has been updated. It looks pretty similar to what was there before, but, but some slight differences. So make sure that you're using the, the appropriate application. Uh, as, as 
the, we, we mentioned earlier, the idle advance is no longer netted against the loan amount. So you, uh, you won't lose that, that 10, 000, the benefit of that 10,000 as a grant. And uh, you must not have permanently closed. So they want to ensure that you are still an existing ent entity before you can receive. You, you can't the shut down and then just take the money and go buy a Lamborghini. <laughs> Come on. Where's the fun in that? All right. So what's still the same now on these new first draw loans? So it's still based on two and a half times the average monthly payroll costs for, for 2019. There's still the 500 employee limit with the exception where, where unless it, it's mentioned otherwise, the 100,000 annualized uh, compensation cap and still must use the funds on the authorized authorized uses such as payroll, rent, utilities, mortgage interest costs, uh, and, and the other expenses that, that we mentioned, but um, must have been in business before uh, February 15th. So this is you could of 2020, you still can't create an entity just to get EPP. It, it is a 1% interest five-year term loan and the affiliation rules still apply. And those, as we know, are pretty complicated. So if you're not right. sure about that, make sure you get professional help on that. Great. So good summary. Now we've covered all the first draw loans, whether they're issued in 2020 or issued in 2021. And now we introduce this new concept of second draw loans. Uh, so Matt, why don't you walk us through who gets one of those and what's the deal on some of those? So you must have obviously received a first draw loan in order to be eligible for a second draw loan. And you have to have spent or will spend all of the proceeds on authorized, use, authorized uses at disbursement. So you, uh, you don't necessarily have to have received uh, full forgiveness, but you have to make sure that you have spent all the funds. You must have incurred a 25% or more gross receipts decline in 2020 compared with that same quarter in 2019, or if it's easier just, and you qualify by looking at uh, calendar year 2020 versus 2019, you can, you can uh, meet that threshold that way. I'll, I'll discuss uh, what gross receipts is uh, in, in uh, another slide. You must have 300 or fewer employees. So this is, this is headcount. Similar to, uh, if you're receiving the second draw, you obviously applied for the first draw. So it's similar to the headcount number that you included on your original application. But as, as you see, not every organization that received a first draw will be eligible for a second draw. Uh, and I just want to, I want to underscore Matt's point there because there's a tremendous amount of confusion on this particular topic of employees and FTEs because uh, they, they use them almost interchangeably, but they are very clearly not the same thing. So on loan applications, uh, first draw or second draw, they want to know about the number of noses. How many people are you paying W-2 wages to? On forgiveness, then they want to go to full-time equivalents, which is a whole different story. Obviously, you know, 10 hours uh, a, a week is 0.25 FTEs, but it's considered one employee that you're paying. So make sure that you are clear that, that for a loan application, the eligibility is a function of the number of noses, number of people to whom you pay W-2 wages. And I did mention that you, you, you don't have to have filed for the forgiveness yet, but you, you do have to make sure that you spent the funds prior to applying. Uh, you'll need to reference the SBA loan number of the first draw on the application. Uh, John mentioned the, the Shuttered Venues Grant. So you, I think for organizations that are eligible for the Shuttered Venues Grant, make sure you do the analysis of which would be better uh, prior to filing for the, the, the PPP loan because um, you, you, you can only receive one or the other. Uh, forgiveness rules are unchanged from the first draw loans uh, as far as we know. We, yeah, I, I think we <laughs> so far. We, yeah, well, we, I think we'll the, this the by yours truly there. <laughs> yeah, the, the, this experience has has told us that that everything is is the same until it's changed. 
Exactly. One thing uh, also that I want to make sure I underscore on the loan application where they do ask for the for the loan number of your first draw loan, make sure that you put in the SBA's loan number, which is different than the loan number issued by your lender. Okay, so make sure that you've got the SBA loan number when you put that in or else the SBA is going to get completely lost. Okay, so there's there's some similarities between these first draw loans and some second draw loans. Obviously there's different eligibility requirements, Matt, but let's kind of talk about the aspects that are, are definitely different between first draw loans and second draw loans. So we we're talking about on the first draw loans, the economic uncertainty, whereas the second draw loans, uh, there's a 25% year over year decline in any quarter of 2020. Uh, there's still still me uh, that that certification of economic uncertainty, but I think it's it, it's a little bit different where we we now uh, they they now have that 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 hard number of being able to meet that 25% uh, decline, uh, whereas they didn't have that uh, that specific before. The employee cap on first draw loans is 500. This has been reduced to 300. But only for second draw loans. Any Correct. first draw loan, whether it was last year's or this year's, is still five hundred. Correct. The loan amount is is mainly the same, with the exception of the uh, if there's a, a NAICS seventy two code. So think hospitality, hotels, restaurants. They uh, they're instead of two and a half times payroll monthly payroll. It's uh, three and a half times, so, but for every other organization, it's still two and a half times average monthly payroll. And Matt, just so everybody's clear, what's the definition of payroll costs that goes into this calculation? So it, it's generally gross wages. It's gross wages plus uh, the retirement, uh, the employer provided retirement um, and, and health benefits. Right. And health benefits now includes group life and disability. So that's exciting. Mm -hmm. The payroll cost period for, for the first draw loans is 2019. The second draw, you have an option. So you can still use 2019. So for anyone who received the, uh, the first draw loan, it could ex be the same number. Uh, and, and you could be using the same information if you're using 2019. You could use 2020 or the prior 12 months of loan disbursement. So you do have an option on the second draw. Right. And that last piece would be after February 1st, obviously, at which point you could go February 1st of 20 to January 31st of 21, if you wanted. And this really comes down to sort of what are you trying to accomplish? If you want to maximize the loan proceeds, you're probably going to want to use 2019 in given that most entities had more payroll, more employees in 2019 than they did in 2020. Uh, if in uh, that may put you, however, into a situation where you're going to struggle to get full forgiveness. And if your goal is, I want to get enough that I can get fully forgiven and not have anything I have to pay back, you may want to use the 2020 or trailing 12 months uh, as your baseline for calculation. So it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Getting 1% money for five years, not a bad deal, probably the least you're going to get anywhere. Uh, at any time, but nonetheless, some businesses do not want to have anything that they have to pay back. They just want basically a forgiven grant. So you'd be careful about your choice on this one, depending on what your goal is. And the maximum loan amount previously was 10, 10 million per entity, uh, 20 million for corporate group. Now that has been reduced. So it is a hard cap of $2 million per entity, 4 million for the corporate group. There were the restrictions on the first draw loans were really publicly traded companies. There are restrictions based on t uh, affiliation and uh, shareholders from China, political lobbying firms, uh, anyone receiving the shuttered venues grant, and in addition to publicly traded companies. Great. So Matt, there's a lot of nuances as it relates strictly to nonprofit entities. So why don't you walk through kind of what that means, particularly around the gross receipts issue that's mm -hmm. so uh, prevalent in the second draw loans. So this is one of the biggest differences, which 
I, I find interesting that only nonprofit uh, organization gross receipts was defined in, in the CAA, uh, but it's defined in only the way that we see in the Internal Revenue Code, which is it's not actually in the Internal Revenue Code, like they say. You have to look to the Treasury regulations. But what this includes is gross sales or receipts from business activity. So that's not just UBI, that's um, exempt function revenue as well. So uh, that would be included in your business activities. And it would also include contributions, gifts, grants, uh, similar amounts, dues or assessments for members or affiliated organizations and investment income as well. Uh, in, importantly, it's, it's also gross amount received from the sale of assets, but it is the gross amount. So you do not reduce it for the cost or basis of the sale. So uh, if you sold an asset for 100,000, but really, uh, you broke even, the amount that would be included would be the 100,000. You do not include cost of good, uh, goods or assets sold or cost of operations. Um, I like to say, think of how gross receipts gets uh, reported in, in heading G of the form 990. So it is, it is total gross receipts and not netted. Okay, thank you, Matt. I really appreciate that diving into some of the details there. So let's answer a few questions that uh, I know will be popping up as we as we get into this. Let's start with kind of the first one, which is um, with this twenty five percent decline concept. How do I prove that? What are what's my lender going to want to see from me on that? They're they're going to need something that's going to indicate what um, how whether whether it's uh, something that supports the uh, your your gross receipts numbers. Um, if it's obviously they're you know they're thinking if you're providing annual that it could be a tax return, but we know a lot of organizations are fiscal year. So whether that is um, quarter if if you have any quarterly um, quarterly documents um, uh, for your financials, anything that would support the numbers that you're providing. So, John, can you go into a little bit more of the new expense category? Uh, what, what are these covered supplier costs? Yeah, covered supplier costs are an interesting thing because it's, it's a brand new topic that they've included in the expense categories of allowable for forgiveness and as an authorized use of PPP money. And the covered supplier cost is basically anything that you needed uh, that's essential to the operation of your business that's under contract uh, at the time or prior to the time that you received the loan. Okay. So for example, let's say you've got a long-term supply contract from a trusted vendor uh, that is you, know, you, you can't operate without that. As long as that was in place, you can use those kinds of costs. It's a, it's a broad category because they don't define essential but nonetheless, that's kind of what they're talking about is uh, those sorts of supply costs that are going to be essential to your ability to operate uh, your entity in the way that you need to. Okay, next question, Matt. If I took a second draw loan, and this question has already come up a bunch. So I had a first draw loan. I'm taking a second draw loan. If the combined value of that ends up over $2 million, is that going to trigger the SBA to ask me for a Form 3510 to justify the economic necessity of the loan? And the, the answer is we don't know for certain. Uh, what, nothing was, uh, what was mentioned. There's no guidance on this at, at that point. point. Uh, so the, the question is whether the, it will, obviously the, um, there, there is a cap on the second draw loan and there is the requirement that you show the the reduction in, in gross receipts so so at this point we do not know yeah we don't know for certain but it, it's it's not an unreasonable expectation that if you qualify for that second draw loan it's because you had obviously a pretty big hit to your revenues or your gross receipts for the year that sort of is at least to us prima facie evidence that you had economic necessity. Whether they ask for this form or not, we're just going to have to wait and see. But that's uh, that's a question that has come up a lot. 
certainly as we get into uh, all of the details around calculating loan amounts, around handling the forgiveness application and everything that goes into those things, we're here to help you. If you think you would like to have some professional assistance with this, we have an entire team that this is exactly what they do. And they're, they're well-trained and they have done truly hundreds and hundreds of these applications. So all you really need to do, if you're interested in this, is visit the website that you see on the right-hand side, learn.armaninollp.com slash SBA. Sign up for the service there. Once we've got that uh, engagement letter from you, we'll send you a list of the documentation we need and we'll take it from there. You can focus on what you do best, which is not this stuff. It's taking care of your entity and all of the services that it provides into the community. So we'll take it from there and make it as easy as possible for you. If you are interested in learning lots and lots more, We've got truly hundreds of questions on a searchable FAQ library that you see in the lower right-hand corner of the slide. Encourage you to visit that if you really want to get into the details because they're all covered there. Okay, so that covers the PPP program. We then said uh, early on in the agenda that we're going to talk as well about this very lucrative employee retention credit or what we call as the ERC. Now, this is another part of the CARES Act that got modified by the Economic Aid Act in December that a lot of people don't know about. And the reason why is because there was all this press and rush to get PPP money. And if you had PPP money, you couldn't take an employee retention credit. That's now changed. In the Economic Aid Act, you can do both. You can't double dip, and we'll talk about what that means, but you can get an employee retention credit even if you have a PPP loan. So the ERC is intended to reward the employers who did right by their employees. So if I had to lay you off, but I still paid your health benefits, that's cool. This will help you qualify. If I had you staying home, really not productive, nothing for you to do, but I wanted to still keep you on the payroll, even if it was only for a little while before I decided I just can't continue to do that, this ERC is for you. Pipe up and listen closely. So here's kind of how it works. All right. In 2020, this was limited to uh, 50% of eligible wages up to $10,000. So think of it this way. Any, any employee who earned at least that much, you could get what you see there in green, up to $5,000 worth of credit against your payroll tax liability. It's not an income tax thing that's only available to for-profit taxpayers. This is a payroll tax credit. So it goes on your 941 that you file every quarter. Now here's where it gets really exciting. In 2021 now, this is applicable and available to people for both Q1 and Q2 at a quarterly amount of $7,000 per quarter. So if this is uh, available to you for both the first and second quarters of 2021, we're talking up to $14,000 per employee of credit. And what's really cool about this is this is a refundable and advanceable credit, meaning if the credit is larger than what your tax liability was, the rest of it's going to come to you in a check. That's extraordinary. And this is the this is not something you're going to have to file for forgiveness for. It's just something that you'll put in on your 941 forms, and Matt will take you through kind of the details on that in a little bit. Now, as with most things, this is not a simple program from the government. The work papers that are involved here are very complex, and as I said, you can't double dip. So while if you got a PPP loan, you can take the ERC if you qualify, you can't use the same wages for both forgiveness of a PPP loan and an ERC credit. You're going to have to segregate it, and you're going to have to be very careful about how you segregate, whether that's the people or the time frame involved. So this is one aspect of it. The second is R&D credits, and uh, a third is around the Families First Act. Again, you can't double dip on that. You can still get the advantage of the Paid COVID Leave Act, but you can't use the same wages for an ERC or a PPP. Also, there's very strict rules around uh, jobs that are paid for in part by 
grants from third parties. So something that we're going to have to be very, very careful with if we're going to consider both eligibility and applying for it. But it's very exciting in the case that you're able to do it. Here's a few examples. So we've got a couple for profit and a, and a not for profit that we've worked on on this. Let's focus on the not for profit one there in the middle. This was a small not for profit, fewer than 20 full time employees. Um, but and, and again, some of the revenue did come from other sources, but because they were in a shutdown situation because they were deemed non-essential and they still paid some of those staff for a period of time, they were eligible for a tax credit approaching $75,000. Think about it. It's an under 20 employee not-for-profit. We're working with another one actually right now. It's four employees and it's a $45,000 tax credit, even though it's just four employees. You get to the other side, you can see some of these for-profit examples, one on the left, a cosmetic retailer, the one on the right, a gym that had uh, certainly more staff than what we we're talking about in our nonprofit examples, and the tax credits get very large. We're actually working on a for-profit one right now that's $3.2 million. So the numbers get real big, real fast. And that's because of the way the rules are constructed. So Matt, why don't you walk us through sort of the rules as they apply for 2020, which is still available to you, and then how it looks for 2021. Right. So we'll break off. I'll start with 2020. And I think um, a, lot, a lot of organizations really didn't focus on this previously because if you receive the PPP, um, then you couldn't receive the employee retention credit. And anyone who qualified for the employee retention credit probably took the PPP. So the, um, we, we are saying um, organizations should take a look at 2020 to see whether they can qualify now that they know that they can potentially receive both. So in order to qualify in 2020, which when we get to 2021, you'll see there, there are some slight differences that you had to have at least a more than 50% drop in revenue comparing 2020 quarter uh, that quarter in 2020 to the corresponding quarter in 2019, or there was a disruptive government order to suspend or partially suspend your operations. So uh, you can qualify either if uh, you've answered yes to A, or you answered B and you had less than 100 staff, or you answered B, yes to B, they had more than 100 workers and paid people who were unable to provide services during the period. So I think that's a, an important distinction that if you do qualify under the, uh, the shutdown, so B, if you had between uh, 100 and, and, and essentially 500 employees, you, you basically had to make sure that uh, you're only including in the credit amount those workers who you paid not to work. So here's how it works, just visually looking at it is uh, for 2020, the employee retention cre credit, it's up to $5,000 uh, total for the year. Uh, you're looking at the question of, was there a government shutdown, whether it was partial or, or full or the receipts. And ultimately you'll get to the two places where you can take the, um, the credit, which would be the form 941, which is your nor normal quarterly payroll um, return, which it would be a 941 X. So if you're going back, to get a refund on 2020, or there's the form 7200. So that's a separate filing. That's a, a, an advanced payment of uh, payroll taxes. So here is 2020, which John went through that, or sorry, 2021, went through that in a little bit more detail and, and it is uh, easier to qualify and the benefits are significantly better than they were in 2020. So you only have to show a 20% drop in revenue comparing the uh, 2020 qu quarter versus 2019, or when comparing Q4 of 2020 to uh, Q4 2019. So, or you had that disruptive government order to suspend or partially suspend. So either you can qualify by, uh, same as last time, by A, you have the revenue decrease uh, but instead of it being 50%, now it's down to 20%, or you answered uh, yes to be. So you have the government shut down and you have less than 500 staff. So, um, or 
you answered yes to be and have more than 500 workers and pay people who are unable to provide services during the period. So, yeah, so it changed a bunch from 100 to 500. And uh, that's when, when the dollars get really large and contrasted with 2020, where it was $5,000 per employee per year. This is $7,000 per employee per quarter. So the numbers get really big, really fast in 2021. And similar to the last one, it's a flow chart ultimately leading you to filing uh, uh, not, uh, 941. Uh, likely it will be whether it's your first quarter or second quarter, 2021, 941, or uh, the form 7200 if you wanted to get an advanced uh, refund for the amount. Right. And certainly we've written uh, a bunch of information around this to try to take what's a pretty complicated program and put it into plain English for you. And you can find that on our website. It's called Consolidated Appropriations Act Expands Employee Retention Credit. It's about a two-page read, and uh, it is uh, as understandable as we can take a government program and try to make it for you. So, Matt, here again, a few questions that uh, I know uh, a lot of people are asking around this program. So let's start with the first one. How do I determine this base headcount if it's under 500 or under 100 in 2020? So it, it is full-time. So you're looking um, at, at that um, to determine whether you, um, you are under that amount. Great. So just full-time. Okay. John, what constitutes a government shutdown order? Uh, this is going to be um, a wide range of things. It can be, depending on your entity, it can be a local, a uh, county, it can be a state level or even a federal level uh, order. For example, even if it's not a complete shutdown order, something that is shutting down a non-essential part of your uh, business. So for example, let's say that you're a school district. Schools are obviously considered essential, but if all the schools are in distance learning, the school bus drivers and the cafeteria workers may be uh, furloughed or laid off, but still being paid. Uh, so there, that part is a non-essential part of an essential business. So it's anything that really has a significant impact that's been uh, brought down on the entity by a government order, you're going to need to be able to, uh, provide evidence of that order than how that affects you. And it may have only been for a short period of time, may have only been for four or six weeks. That's still okay. But, but it's something that we're going to be able to have to uh, actually produce the order. It's not just, well, I was told by so-and-so. It's no, it's, it's let's see the order. Okay, next question. You, we've talked about how you can't double dip. You can't use PPP payroll money as the same for forgiveness that you would use for ERC money. So Matt, how do, how do we go about separating those? I think this is where you need to be careful and, and really just make sure you do your planning and understand what your what payroll costs that you're going to be using for one versus the other and, and make sure that you you don't they don't overlap, but that you plan ahead and make sure that you you have that documentation to keep them separate. Yeah, and this is one area where, for example, uh, an awful lot of uh, things were happening in the second half of March last year and first half of April. And a lot of people didn't really get their PPP money until say mid April, that time frame between mid March and mid April is available for the ERC. So you you can use payroll money from that time period pre PPP. If you got your loan in mid April, you were likely done with the covered period around the first or early October, which leaves most of Q4 available to you as well. So you can pick time periods, uh, but you're gonna have to be very careful about it to make sure that they are in fact separated. And then Matt, can we just have the payroll company do this? Is that is that something that they've got the information for? I mean, they might have some information that can help you, but ultimately you're going to have to do the work uh, and, and file the, the 941s or the 7200. Yeah, because you're going to have to get very specific about which employees for which hours were you paying and they were non-productive. Uh, even if they weren't sitting at home, you may have just said, uh, for the time being, show up, but I don't have anything for you to do. That's okay. 
So you're going to have to just get into the details that apparel companies just not going to know on that. And you're going to have to be able to produce evidence to support it. These are very complicated uh, narratives that need to be put together to be able to support getting the ERC in part because the dollars are so large and it's effectively free money for you. So of course they're going to want to see some support. So Matt, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, all of your nonprofit expertise on this and hope this has been helpful for everybody. Certainly, if you do have questions, you can connect with our team at experts at armeninollp.com. We have tons of information up on our COVID-19 Resource Center. Just go to our homepage right there at the top. It's, an, it's a one-click link into all kinds of resources around how to deal with all of the aspects of COVID-19 support, not only government programs, but an awful lot of other areas as well. So Matt, thank you once again. Thank you all for joining us today. We hope it's been helpful for you. Good luck. Thanks, everyone.